Good morning. It's a pleasure to be back at, uh, at one of these wonderful sessions with teachers. What, why is this thing in front of me anyway? You don't need it. I don't need it. No. I hate PowerPoint. <laughs> I mean, just not that you asked me. <laughs> uh, as I said, I'm delighted to be back here at one of these sessions. I really respect what you folks try to do. In a way, I think it's a kind of a mission impossible, or a mission improbable. But uh, you keep doing it, and that's, uh, that, makes it, that makes it pretty remarkable. Um, and I wish you all the best success. I'm going to try to help a little bit uh, in your understanding of the subject starting off. It's uh, not an easy, not an easy uh, subject for me to talk about for a variety of reasons. Uh, one reason is physical. I got back just yesterday morning, the day before yesterday morning from five days in the Middle East, and five days in the Middle East and a 14 and a half hour flight is just pr the precise formula for discombobulating your mind and body to maximum effect. I feel fairly discombobulated. Um, also, of course, it's too much to cover. A lot happened uh, in the run-up to the creation of the Palestine Mandate and uh, then the history of the Mandate and then the end of the Mandate. We'd be here until next Wednesday, um, at least, uh, to really cover all of the, uh, the aspects of the subject that deserve to be covered. So I'll have to speak somewhat telegraphically and leave a lot out, which dismays me, and it may dismay you too. Um, and then there's something else rather personal, not, not physical, but, but mental. You know, I really haven't paid much attention to this history for at least 20 years. Uh, uh, back, back at a certain point, my doctor told me to reduce my, my stress level. And so I decided that one good way to do that would be to uh, stop giving a damn about uh, the Arabs and the Israelis and the Palestinians and all that stuff and just, you know, um, you know, shoot, pull, drink beer and sort of relax. And I succeeded. I did a, I did a pretty good job of ignoring it. The result is, and I, haven't, I have never actually lectured on this subject per se, and I'm not a professional historian either, and so I feel a little inadequate um, about trying to get this across in, a, in, a, in an intelligible way. Uh, and then one final warning, please. It, it's a Saturday morning at 9 o'clock. My typical cadence, my typical voice cadence, for more than 50 years um, on a Saturday morning at 9 o'clock is to chant. So if I break out in a chant, please forgive me. I don't know, I don't know what, what the probability is of my doing that, but I just wanted to warn you, give you fear warning. Okay, now let's get into this, and let me make sure that I know what time it is, because uh, time and I are not always friendly to one another. Yeah, you'll, you'll help me. I know you will. <laughs> uh, what I want to... Looking at the way that the program is set up, other people are going to discuss aspects of the subject matter, the larger subject matter, that will invariably overlap a little bit on what I'm talking about. For the, you know, the origins of Zionism, the origins of Palestinian nationalism, it all kind of folds and flows together. So um, rather than focus uh, uh, on what, what happened, well, I'm, go I'm going to talk about what happened during the mandate, but rather than focus on the road to partition after, after World War II, and rather than talk about, at any length, uh, the uh, uh, legacy of the mandate period itself, I'd like, to, I'd like to talk more about the origins of the Palestine mandate, uh, which would take us at least through Tuesday, if we were going to do it properly. Um, and let me, as a true American, the way that the Americans talk about these things, let me tell you what the conclusion is <laughs> before I actually tell you anything at all about the history. If you immerse yourself in the history of this period, and uh, I had an opportunity about 20 years ago to do so, and I'll, I'll get back to uh, the result later. Uh, what you find is that all of the uh, favorite unifactorial theories about what causes the variance in international politics uh, are all wrong. Uh, there are those who believe, I'm sure you recognize the, uh, the school of thought, that it's all about economics. It's all about the relationship of various classes to the means of production, and if you understand the economics uh, underlying, uh, under the surface, then you understand everything uh, that happened, and that's not right. And then there are others who are sort of geopolitical realists who believe that if you understand the power vectors and such and so forth, that you'll understand everything that happened, and that's not right. And then there are those culturalists, like the late Samuel Huntington, who believe that if you understand the cultural templates, uh, that will give you the, 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 the key that unlocks the door uh, to wisdom and understanding, and that's not right either. And then there are those who believe in the power of personality, the great man theory. He'll tell you that it really every, history really turns on um, uh, the force of intellect and the force of, uh, of personality 
of great leaders like people like, in this case, like Chaim Weizmann and Winston Churchill and uh, Lord Curzon and so forth and so on, and that's not right either. Or rather, put it differently, all of those perspectives are right, but they're not right in their entirety. If you really get into an historical case study, whether it's the Palestine Mandate or anything else, and you really get into the archives, and you look at all the secondary literature, and, you, and it feels as though it is incredibly complicated. That is some wag once said, history is a foreign country. Uh, and it is incredibly ornate, and that there are several uh, uh, factors that flow in and out of one another uh, to mostly unpredictable ends. Uh, and uh, it's a tapestry that never really uh, finishes, but goes on and so on and so forth so that you don't, there's no logical starting point always in an historical analysis, and there's no logical end point either. If it seems complicated, murky, extremely difficult, that's because it is. And there isn't any shortcut, there isn't any silver bullet, there isn't any unifactorial way to obviate that complexity and that richness. That's what life is. So that's the conclusion. I guess I could stop now, right? Okay, what I want to talk about is really three questions about the mandate. First of all is why. Why did the mandates get created? In particular, why did the Palestine mandate get created? Uh, the second uh, question I want to deal with is how did it, did it come into existence? Not exactly the same as why, uh, although they, the two questions do have a tendency to bump into one another. And then third, uh, a seemingly trivial matter, but really not so trivial. Uh, if you lean the whole episode forward into the, into the 20th, 20th and 21st century, is where the Palestine, the Palestine mandate was. I mean, really, people, people just kind of assume, well, everybody knows where Palestine is, right? And everybody knew where Palestine was in 1914 and 1917 and 1920. And 19 Palestine was Palestine, and it didn't, doesn't move around. Countries don't move around on maps. Want to bet? <laughs> There's a great presumption, uh, looking backwards from, you know, from many years later on, about uh, where Palestine was and how, what everybody understood, where, where uh, who, everybody understood Palestine to be a certain, and it wasn't, it's not true. And indeed, there is, in the literature, in the secondary literature anyway, uh, a great deal of rubbish uh, on these things, uh, common truths that are not correct, that have been repeated time and time again uh, to the point where it's so embedded in, um, in again, common knowledge of this, of this period that it's almost it's like a nail without a head. Uh, it's easy to get an error into the historical uh, consciousness, but it's almost impossible to get it out again. I myself was a victim of this common knowledge error uh, until, until about 20 years ago, and I'm going to when I get to the end, I'm going to try to explain to you uh, the, what devilment this kind of, of error um, has caused. So let's now go back to the beginning. Why? Well, I would start, I think, with uh, the geopolitics of the matter. Um, if you go back some years before um, uh, the, the Great War, the World War, and by the way, you should note, uh, language is very important when you're teaching history. Nobody in 1917 or 1920 or 1923 referred to the war as World War I. And the reason was because there was not yet a World War II in order to give some meaning to the... So when I, when I, when I edit in the magazine and people are referring to what happened between 1914 and 1918, and they refer to it as World War I, whenever I can, I strike it and just call it the World War, because that's what people at the time called it, just, just for fun, you know. Okay, now, it really has to do with geopolitics. Now, as you, as you probably know, uh, throughout much of the 19th century, uh, Britain played uh, a role in the concert of Europe in the great balance of power scheme that uh, uh, arose after the Napoleonic Wars uh, in what is today referred to uh, as an offshore balancer. Uh, Britain, of course, an island, uh, island nation, maritime power, uh, uh, to simplify a little bit, uh, was concerned that no hegemon arise in Europe that could threaten British interests, either the security of the British Isles themselves or uh, Britain's uh, preeminent role as uh, a trading power and a maritime power. And so what Britain would do is it would, uh, it would side with the weaker powers in order to make sure that um, uh, no larger power uh, gained hegemonic uh, position. And so what that meant for a great deal in the 19th century was that Britain supported the Ottoman Empire, which was uh, a peripheral but nevertheless integral part of the whole balance of power uh, scene, not so much in Europe proper, but certainly in the Balkans and in the Middle East and uh, all the way out to North Africa and uh, to the approaches of the Raj in India. Uh, in fact, the, one of the reasons uh, the British uh, tended to support the Ottomans was because uh, the Ottomans kept the Russians busy 
And the, and, the, and the British back in those days, in the middle of the 19th century, were always worried about the Russians encroaching on their preserve in the Raj in India. And if you read the travel literature of, of the time, it's all about where the railheads are going and where, where Russians were seen, you know, drinking in a bar somewhere in Hyderabad or something like that. Uh, that was the great intrigue uh, of the time. That's, you know, what, what pipelines are today to some people, that like, railroad lines were back in the 19th century. In any event, uh, so Britain had this uh, affinity for supporting uh, Ottoman policy, not always, but uh, over the whole. But what happened was uh, something changed pretty dramatically in 1882 when the British found themselves, for re reasons that we don't have time to talk about, ensconced in Egypt. And from the growing British position in Egypt, which of course was critical because in 1869 the Suez Canal was open. And remember, British policy back in the 19th century, although it was varied, uh, India was really the key to British imperial uh, power and status, and um, the, con the strategic was concern was, was being able to access India and to, pr to preserve the route between the metropole, between Britain itself, and India. The Suez Canal, of course, was a great boon to this, and the story of how the canal got written, how the, how the canal got built and financed and all that, a fascinating story which we have no time to discuss, unfortunately, but clearly Egypt becomes very, very important to the British after the canal is opened, and uh, after 1882, the British are essentially there, okay? Over time, what happens is that uh, the, the British begin to lose their affection for the Ottoman Empire, and they begin to uh, grow more confident in their ability to protect the route to India because of their preeminent position in Egypt and around the Suez Canal. You might put it this way, for a long, long time, the Ottoman Empire was the wife, and Egypt was the mistress. Uh, but over time, uh, the wife uh, became less interesting, and, uh, and the mistress took pride of place if you like a, a metaphor of that kind, and if you don't, pa please pardon me. So um, essentially, uh, uh, meanwhile, the Ottoman Empire, uh, in its efforts to modernize and in its efforts to uh, strengthen itself, became more and more oriented toward Germany. And again, I don't want to go into the long history of how after 1870, after the unification of the Reich, uh, Germany began to compete with uh, other powers, not just in Europe, but also uh, in a naval race and, and on the high seas, and to challenge British commercial supremacy on the high seas. Uh, but the Turks found an affinity with the Germans, and uh, a, a lot of training of Ottoman soldiers, a lot of back and forth and education uh, went, went on between uh, the Ottoman Empire and Germany. And there were, there were uh, two symbols uh, back in those days, again, symbols really matter in, in international relations, uh, that I think that epitomized this growing relationship between the Ottoman Empire and, uh, and Germany. One was, uh, uh, was the Hejaz Railroad, which, is, which back in those days was a very, just basically runs on the east bank of uh, the Jordan River from Aqaba up toward um, the Sea of Galilee, toward a place called Semak and El Himma, and then off, off to, the, to the east, uh, with spurs, one to Haifa, another spur from Haifa up to uh, Beirut. Uh, and then uh, the, uh, the vaunted Berlin to Baghdad Railroad, which was uh, obviously, not just for tourists. I mean, the purpose of the Germans helping the Turks uh, build a Berlin uh, to Baghdad railroad, but don't forget Baghdad, Iraq, was part of the Ottoman Empire uh, before the First World War, before the, war, the World War, excuse me. And um, the reason for this was quite simple. The, the, uh, the, the, the Turks uh, uh, worried, ultimately, like any great power worries about its flanks, its geopolitical flanks, the vulnerability of them, and thought uh, the British might one day come from Egypt and invade uh, the uh, Arab lands of the Ottoman Empire. And so the railroad was designed to be able to facilitate the movement of troops and materiel in order to protect the Arab territories of the Ottoman Empire. And the Germans were perfectly happy and as strategically interested to help the Ottomans pr uh, protect themselves against possible a British uh, 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 avaricious behavior. And of course, uh, it wasn't for, not for naught that they did this because uh, that's exactly what happened during the Great War. <laughs> the British did come from India, from India, from Egypt, uh, up north and conquered the area, conquered the Arab territories of the Ottoman Empire, exactly as was feared <laughs> uh, by the Ottoman Turks for a number of years. Um, uh, the reason I go through this is because uh, if, the, if the Ottoman Empire had not decided to join the Central Powers in the, in the World War, uh, then presumably it's at, least, it's at least possible to imagine that the Ottoman Empire would not have lost its Arab territories. Uh, it would not have been dismembered at Versailles, as the Habsburg uh, monarchy was also dismembered, and, uh, and some other kind of history, some parallel universe would have, would have emerged. But Enver Pasha, who was the uh, 
he was not the sultan, of course, but he was, he was more important than the sultan uh, when it came to these kinds of things. Abdel Hamid, I don't know what he was doing uh, most of the time. I'm not sure if anybody knew. But Enver Pasha decided to, th to throw in uh, the Ottoman Empire's fate with the Germans in the war. And uh, uh, in the literature, sometimes this decision is described as whimsical or uh, irresponsible. Uh, I wouldn't characterize it that way. If you actually read the history, you find uh, a different calculus, different way to understand what en um, uh, Enver Pasha did. Uh, it, it was a calculated bet, okay? If the Central Powers had won the war, uh, the Ottoman Empire would have been a big, big winner, okay? It would have been able to, uh, hypothetically, uh, uh, expel the British from Egypt, uh, of course, Egypt was taken from uh, the sublime port. It could have restored its position, in other words, in Egypt, and that was the key to restoring and strengthening its position throughout North Africa. Moreover, you know, there had been a, despite the concert of Europe's, despite the claim about the concert of Europe that it ushered in a century of peace between the end of the Napoleonic Wars and the onset of the Great War in 1914, it wasn't so peaceful for everybody. It certainly, it did prevent hegemonic war on the scale of the Napoleonic Wars, but it didn't prevent war. And if you look at the historical record, you find that the Ottoman Empire and Russia fought a number of wars during this century, and the, the Ottoman Empire lost just about every one of them. So there was this encroachment uh, of Russia, and also the Habsburgs, too, on the, the, on the Balkan, on the Balkan uh, parts of the Ottoman Empire over a number of years. And of course, the, the Third Balkan War is really what, what triggered the, the array of conditions that, that led, in part, to the First World War. So the, 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 the Enver Pasha imagined that if, they, if the Central Powers could win the war, and Russia, of course, was, be, was, was a member of, the, of the, uh, the Allies, allied with Britain and France, that they would be able to recoup some of the lost territories that the Russians had grabbed from them over the previous 40, 50, 60 years. Uh, and uh, uh, pressure from the Russians on the Dardanelles, and, and, uh, and they were getting close to some very strategic territory that the Ottomans held. Uh, all of this would go away, and things would really, really look up. This could be a real shot in the arm for the Ottoman Empire as a, as a, as a great power. Uh, what about the other side of the bet? What if, what if, uh, what did Emperor Pasha believe about, about uh, Turkey's possibly losing the war? Uh, he didn't give it much thought, evidently. Uh, nobody thought in 1914 that the war was going to last as long as it did. No one thought that it was going to be as brutal and bloody as it turned out to be. And uh, it was inconceivable to Emperor Pasha that, uh, that the Ottoman Empire could, suff could suffer a total unconditional defeat and be so beaten that it would be dismembered uh, by, the, by, the, uh, uh, by the Allies. And you know, he wasn't complete, of course the Ottoman Empire did lose the war along with uh, Germany and the Habsburg Empire, but he wasn't totally wrong. I mean, if you think about it, uh, the, uh, uh, the Ottoman Empire was referred to uh, in the 19th century and the early part of the 20th century as the sick man of Europe. You've all heard that phrase, no doubt, right? Well, what you may not know is that the author of that phrase was none other than Tsar Nicholas II. Now, the Russian Empire did not survive the, the World War, but the Turks did pretty well. I mean, they defended themselves at Gallipoli. Uh, the British, and the, not to speak of the French, were never able to really land a serious force in, uh, in Turkish-inhabited territories. Uh, when the war ended, when the, the Great War ended, it didn't really end for the Turks because they fought another war against the Greeks and, and, and other, uh, other associates. Uh, in 1920, uh, putting, putting paid to the Treaty of Sevres and leading to, to, the, to, to Luzon in 1923-24, which, which fully ended the, uh, the, the conflict, and Turkey managed to survive. Uh, it, 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 it did not collapse during, during the Great War. It did all right. Uh, it lost, but it did all right. It did better than the Russians. So this brings us around to well, uh, the question. So that's pretty much, that's pretty much um, the why. Britain wanted um, uh, uh, positions, and the French wanted positions, and the Russians and the Italians also. This is, this is the, the four main uh, uh, participants in the Sykes-Picot, the famous Sykes-Picot uh, agreement. They wanted better positions, strategic positions, in the area uh, uh, where the Ottoman Empire ruled, ruled Arab peoples. Uh, and uh, it's sort of natural. I mean, the spoils of war include taking away the, the stuff that your enemies had. Uh, if you beat them, you get to have their toys. That's basically the the way it works. Uh, you ha I sometimes stop and ask myself, did anybody, did any serious person uh, uh, in Britain or in France ask themselves, what would be the longer term consequences of sweeping away not one, but two pillars of the concert of Europe? What would happen if you took two structural elements, the Ottoman Empire 
and more importantly, the Habsburg Empire, if you took them away and they simply weren't there anymore, what would be the long, longer term strategic, not so much longer term, what would be the consequences of that, of that strategic um, adjustment? Uh, I, I search in vain <laughs> uh, in the archives and in the literature of that time for anyone who actually gave this question much thought. Perhaps the, the true historians in the room will, will uh, uh, enlighten me as to those rare individuals who thought, thought that far ahead. But really, that's, that's not the way that the, the British and the French and the others thought. What they, they, were, they were avaricious. They wanted the territory. They wanted strategic gains. And I think they, they could, th their view was that the, the Habsburg monarchy was decrepit anyway, and the Ottoman Empire was decrepit anyway, and they were going to fall apart sooner or later. So why not now, under the propitious terms of, uh, 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 that could be dictated after, the, after a victorious uh, uh, war? Um, so basically, that's what happened. Uh, the, the history of, of, ha of, of so that's the why, uh, in a nutshell. There's a vast, that's a vast oversimplification, but it'll have to do given the time constraints. Now let's talk a little bit about, about the, uh, um, the how. Well, you know, we all take for granted, uh, I used to take for granted, uh, that uh, during the war, the idea of a League of Nations was hatched, and uh, uh, the idea of mandates as opposed to simply uh, re re uh, repurposing colonial possessions from one great power to another, that the notion of mandates came into being. Uh, I simply read about it in the, in the history books, and I kind of assumed, well, okay, uh, League of Nations, uh, mandates, sure. But I never stopped to ask myself, well, how did this really happen? What's the history of this, of this pretty significant transformation in the way that European powers spoke about and acted uh, on, on, uh, on, on issues of, of uh, spreading their power to, uh, to other, other parts of the world. Um, it, all I can say is that, in brief, the normative environment in Europe had changed. It had changed before the Great War, before the World War. There was something called the Interparliamentary Union, uh, which uh, was founded back in the 1880s. Uh, there was a good deal of uh, international organization activity. There, were the there was the famous arbitration movement uh, in which the United States played an important role. Uh, the, the basic idea being that civilized Western nations could, uh, could uh, comport themselves according to international law in such a way as to uh, create uh, uh, dispute resolution mechanisms and, uh, and to reduce the, uh, the friction uh, that would cause wars. Uh, this was not a utopian uh, enterprise uh, so much as a, a highly a liberal one and you can read the biography of Lord Bryce and other in Britain and uh, William Howard Taft in the United States. Um, people who were, and this is mostly an Anglo, an Anglo phenomenon, this idea of an international organization uh, to, uh, to keep the peace, mostly an Anglo-American uh, kind of thought. Uh, it, uh, it, uh, um, it waxed in its popularity uh, before the war. During the war, given the horrific and unexpected uh, uh, barbarity of the war, the number of casualties, the length of the war, the economic costs of the war, the popularity of these ideas of figuring out a way to prevent another uh, catastrophe, you know, the war to end all wars, uh, led to uh, a, a sharp rise in the popularity of the idea of some kind of League of Nations, as it turned out uh, to be called. And it also uh, led to uh, a different way of thinking about uh, colonies and the power, the, the, the influence of the great powers in outside of Europe, in the world's peripheries. Uh, the, so the mandate, the, the idea of the mandate was, as I think all of you, all of you know, is that this, the mandate was not going to be a colony in the sense that the, the, the great power was not sovereign uh, in, in that territory. It was rather a trusteeship of the uh, victors, the allied victors of the Great War, and uh, the, uh, it was the League of Nations that would assign uh, proprietary manda mandatory uh, responsibilities uh, uh, to take care of these, these of the possessions of the, the German Empire and the Ottoman Empire, the idea was, and if you, I, I don't know if anybody actually did any preliminary reading, I'd be shocked. But uh, you know, if you read uh, Article Twenty Two of the League of Nations uh, uh, Covenant, what you see is uh, this paragraph that talks about uh, peoples who are not yet ready to stand on their own. It's rather, it's rather patronizing language. But you know that's the way people thought, and it wasn't entirely wasn't entirely incorrect. The uh, the predicates of the Weberian formal authority of you know, Weberian state uh, did not exist in many of these places, and so uh, even from a strictly social science point of view, it wasn't just um, 
patronizing language. There was some objective truth to it. So uh, the mandates, as you probably know also, were divided into uh, three plus one categories. There were A mandates, where the peoples uh, uh, were thought to be close uh, to a capacity for self-government, and that, that basically uh, meant Syria and Mesopotamia, later to be called Iraq. And then there were uh, Class B mandates, mostly the mandates in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, former German colonies, uh, Tanganyika, so forth and so on, uh, 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 Cameroon. And then there, were, then there were Type C mandates, which involved uh, mostly the South Pacific, islands in the South Pacific, like the Marianas, the island of Nauru, which had been uh, uh, part of Samoa, which had been German, and so forth. So there, and then, there, of course, the plus one was Palestine. Palestine, a lot of people uh, make the mistake of thinking that Palestine was a type A or class A mandate. It wasn't. It was sui generis. It didn't fit into any of the categories. It was unto itself, and I'll explain in a minute why that was. Um, so uh, the, so the, the idea of the League of Nations sort of uh, super, is superimposed on the idea of mandates, and it really has to do with the change in the normative environment of, of, the, of, of, of European politics between roughly the end of, well, the middle, well, the 1880s, 1890s, through and then accentuated by the, the horrors of the war. And, but there, was, there are two other elements near here that are worth mentioning just in passing. The, the internationalization of various kinds of functions in the 19th century um, uh, includes a whole array of, of functional areas. It includes, for example, universal postal union, of all things, so that countries could send letters back and forth to everybody else and so forth. And that's a fascinating history. This, um, uh, measures and standards. You begin to get uh, international agreement on uh, how countries should handle things like that, standard measures, things like that. Uh, you also got the creation of the International Labor Organization. And this is a fascinating history that, again, we don't have time for. But of all people, uh, one of the great boosters and founders of the International Labor Organization was none other than Otto von Bismarck. And if you want to read about the origins of the International Labor Organization and the role played by Otto von Bismarck, you could read Daniel Patrick Moynihan's dissertation at Tufts University, because that's what he wrote on. <laughs> it's never been published, but it's a fascinating document. In any event, why was Bismarck so interested in labor unions? You know, Of course, in Germany, uh, he was interested in uh, forms of uh, the iron cage, noblesse oblige, uh, making sure that the lumpen proletariat uh, stayed um, um, non-kinetic uh, in terms of domestic um, politics and so on. Well, basically, in those days, people feared the rise of socialist revolution. They feared the rise of Marxism, communism, whatever it was called in those days. And the idea was that if you reform some of these institutions gradually and in concert, then you take away the fuel from the crazies, the radicals, the communists, the Marxists, so on and so forth. Rather the same uh, kind of thinking that, dis that Benjamin Disraeli displayed uh, as a Tory within, uh, within British domestic politics in the, reform, in, the in the Victorian reform era. In any event, uh, there were, and then there's a second reason why the idea of mandates, um, quite aside from the change in the normative environment, and, and uh, making, the, making the imposition of British and French control over the former Ottoman Arab territories somewhat more palatable to the locals, the locals being uh, not entirely thrilled with the idea, um, get back to the locals in a minute, was that, and I just learned this the other day, so I actually learned something from, for, from preparing for this talk, for which I'm very grateful. Reparations played a great role in um, the resolution to, to the Great War. Of course, the burden of reparations ended up being counterproductive and played some, played some role in the discontent that led to the rise of the Nazi party and the onset of the Second World War. But, but lands taken away from Germany and the Ottoman Empire directly appended to one of the um, victor victorious powers counted as a credit toward reparations. And I think it's Article 345 or something like that of the Versailles Treaty talks about this. And, and there are two prominent examples. One is the Saar, and the other is Alsace-Lorraine. Because after the war, those territories were detached from Germany. Uh, they basically came under French, um, French rule. And Germany got a credit for its reparations as a result of, and not how they calculated it. How do you calculate the value of the Saar? I don't know. But Germany got a credit for, for, for that, so its reparations were, were reduced as a result of that, those territories being alienated from German control. And the same would have happened, presumably, if uh, Mesopotamia, Iraq, and Syria, and Palestine had become direct colonies like the other crown colonies in Britain. Uh, 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 the Ottoman Empire would have gotten, would have gotten credit. Uh, in, for it, of course, the reparations burden on, on Turkey was, was modest compared to Germany, but that was one of the reasons. Don't forget that at the end of the First World War, at the end of the World War, pardon me again, the British Exchequer was broke. 
they'd spent pretty much every ducat they had. And they were looking for ways to economize. And if you read the archives, you find this, this, uh, this theme of being broke and needing to save money, needing to find economical and, if necessary, indirect ways of ruling territory to be a very prominent theme in, in the internal discussions within the British government. Um, so who was going to be in charge of Palestine? Uh, who was going to have the mandate for Palestine? Well, when things started, um, uh, when the ideas of the, and, and by the way, the, the whole idea of the League of Nations, uh, the League of Nations Covenant was actually written by a South African named, named Jan Smuts, a fascinating man. And the idea of the mandates, this doesn't really take shape in any kind of actionable political or policy uh, um, way until 1918. So it's rather late in the war um, when it, finally it, 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 you could see who was going to, was likely to win the war, that, that, uh, that uh, the idea of the League of Nations and the idea of the mandates within the League, Article 22, uh, take concrete written shape and it, they, they, they sort of form uh, a reality uh, that whereas before it had been kind of floating in the air, now as the war was starting to draw to a close, uh, uh, these things took shape. And it, it was at this point that the Americans began to have an influence on how this language uh, was, was crafted and on how the future was conceived. Uh, of course, the United States entered the war only in 1917, and the United States entered the war not as an ally, but only as an associated power, all right? I'm not sure what President Wilson thought he was doing by that, but in any event, we were there, but we were not there. Uh, we didn't want to be implicated, essentially, in the uh, imperial uh, um, uh, shenanigans and adventures of the, uh, the old world, uh, the British and the French, we was always idealists, even when we pick up the gun. Uh, we, we are still a lot like that. I won't go into that. Um, the, uh, um, the Europeans wanted the Americans to stick around. Uh, you remember the Dawes Commission later on? They were broke, and we were not. Uh, we emerged from the war uh, uh, stronger rather than weaker in most respects. The Europeans wanted us to stick around for a variety of reasons. And they, they, a lot of them thought that if they talked about the covenant of the League of Nations, they talked about mandates, it would be more attractive to the United States. And the United States would be more likely to enter uh, the, the post-World post -war, post war balance of power to the benefit of Britain in particular, but also France. Well, as you know, it didn't work. It didn't work. Uh, uh, the United States never joined the League of Nations. Uh, Wilson was unable to sell it uh, to the Senate. And uh, more than that, which you may not know, is in, I'm skipping ahead a little bit historically, but I'm on the right theme, I think. Uh, the, the, uh, the mandate, the, ma the idea of the mandates, which was designed to appease the United States uh, and to make uh, the, you know, the war to end all wars have a conclusion that seemed to fit uh, that, little, that little slogan. Actually, the United States, the, the Senate, most people in the United States, uh, did not like the idea of the mandates at all. Uh, Senator Bora, uh, uh, who was one of the uh, uh, great opponents of the League of Nations, um, and who wanted to introduce all, so all sorts of conditions and reservations on the ratification of American participation, which Wilson rejected foolishly. Uh, in any way, uh, Bora said, uh, these mandates are simply a cover for old-fashioned imperialism. And we, will have not we, the United States, will have nothing to do with them. So we had a very dour attitude toward this whole idea. We, we just, we, it looked like smoke and mirrors and decorations for old-fashioned uh, colonial, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 colonial selfishness uh, to Bora and to many of the people in the Senate. And because the United States uh, refused to, to ratify the League, join the League, uh, the United States then had the task of going bilaterally uh, from mandate to mandate to, uh, to negotiate American rights uh, in these various territories. So you find in 1924 there was a negotiation between the United States and Britain over American rights, the Anglo-American Convention, I think it was called, American rights in Palestine. If the United States had signed, had joined the League, uh, it, 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 would have, it would have been okay. Now, it, and something else irritated Bora and members of the, uh, of the Senate and members of the executive branch as well. Uh, at San Remo, uh, which followed Versailles by, uh, you know, uh, uh, Versailles ended in 1919, I forget what, what month, but San Remo took place in April of 1920, and it was designed to, to fill in and flesh out the mandates and, uh, and, and, and make them operational uh, at a time, of course, when the military situation was, was settling but not really entirely settled. Uh, uh, the San Remo Declaration, uh, the preamble of the San Remo Declaration, basically says that the allied powers and associated powers agree that or are in accord that such and such and so forth and so on. And the United States had agreed on no such damn thing. And the United States complained bitterly 
to the four powers assembled at San Remo, Britain, France, Italy, and Japan. We weren't there. Those four guys were there. So it's, it's just, a, just to let you know how the United States reacted to all this, we were, we were not happy. Now at one point, this is interesting, at one point during the war, 19, 1918, when people began to think, okay, General Allenby is going to be headed north, He's got uh, Lawrence of Arabia at his side. You all saw the, saw the movie with Peter O'Toole, right? So you know exactly what happened. <laughs> no, I, I'm serious. Actually, the movie's not bad it's, when it comes to historical, his, his historical fidelity. Uh, of course, it's a little bit, it's a little bit uh, Hollywoodized, but you know, Peter O'Toole was pretty good. And the story that they told about Faisal ending up in, in Damascus and bec be becoming, uh, be being proclaimed king of Syria and then being, being, uh, you know, being thrown out by the French in June of 1920. All that is exactly what happened, pretty much. So for a Hollywood movie, you know, not bad. Um, it's certain, well, I'm going to go into a tangent. I would have such fun, but I won't. Uh, so so uh, uh, the uh, uh, idea uh, that you know, some power on the Allied side was going to end up with the mandate for Palestine. Who should have the mandate? Lord Balfour who was the foreign secretary at the time, actually believed that the United States should take the mandate for Palestine. Uh, and the United States was um, encouraged to, invest, to think about, investigate the idea. So long before, uh, not long before, uh, some time before uh, um, the language of the mandates congealed and Senator Bora and others took, took, uh, um, took exception to, to, how they, to how it was all done, uh, the United States uh, sent two people, it was called the King Crane Commission, sent, President Wilson found these people, sent them to Syria. Syria was a, a geographical term then that included Palestine. Palestine was on no map. Palestine was part of southern Syria. Uh, it was just part, it was called southern Syria. Uh, it sort of it encompassed what is today all of Syria, all of what is Lebanon, all of what is uh, Israel, and what is Jordan, kind of. It's murky. We'll get back to that in a minute. Uh, and. Uh, uh, what they found, if you read the, the King Crane Commission report, uh, it's really quite a remarkable document, and I asked you to take a look at it. I don't know if you've had a chance, but basically they came back and they said, you know what, uh, when we talk to these guys out there, uh, they, don't really want, um, they don't really want the mandate. They don't really want European powers in their faces. They want an independent state. Why do they want an independent state? Because they thought they were promised one. And in fact, they were promised one. In the Hussein McMahon correspondence, a series of, I think, 12 letters back and forth between the Sharif uh, of Mecca, Hussein, and Sir uh, Henry McMahon. In 1915, the idea being to get the Arabs to, uh, uh, to, be a, to, to attack the Turks within their own domain. And this is where the story really starts. Uh, it sort of looks like the British do, in fact, promise the Hashemite family an independent Arab state. And if you look at the original map of Sykes-Picot, and you can, and it, by the way, it used to be, when I, 20 years ago, when I was, when I was doing this, this book, I'll show you in a minute, I actually had to, um, you know, go into the archives and, and look at, physically look at the map, all right? You don't have to do that anymore. It's on the internet. If you just, type, if you just go to Google and type in uh, Sykes-Picot map, the original archival document pops up in color, and you can see the blue zone and the brown zone and zone A and zone B and the dotted line between the southern parts of it and, and the, the, the domain of the Al Saud. Uh, if you do it on your computer rather than on your phone, it's a little crisp. If you look at what Palestine, a little sort of nubulate over to the lower left-hand corner of the original archival map, you can see the first expression, a la 1915-1916, of what uh, Sykes and Picot, the British and the French governments and the Italian government and the Russian government, thought what Palestine was. So we're getting close to the where question that I'll conclude with. Um, but basically, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the United States, uh, the, the, the King Crane Commission said, these people don't want uh, uh, anybody uh, in there. They want to be independent. And uh, we, 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 King and Crane, we don't believe that, uh, uh, that partitioning Syria is a good idea. It's too small and it's too homogeneously Arab uh, to admit of, uh, of, of, of partition. So they were against, they were conditionally against the idea uh, of making um, Beirut or Lebanon a separate area uh, that the French were concerned about for historical reasons, the protection of the Maronite community probably know about. And they were also against the idea of separating southern Syria, namely Palestine, from, from the Syrian mandate. Uh, they also warned that you know, uh, there were lots more Arabs there than there were um, uh, Jews. And they, they, they rail against what they call the extreme Zionist proposal. So it was, a, it, it was an unfriendly document from the Zionist point of view, to put it mildly. But in any, in any event, a convolution of uh, events uh, uh, 
uh, made the British government change Lord Balfour's mind. Well, Lord Balfour didn't change his mind, but the British government decided, no, we want it. Why? And why, did, and why was the map no good? We're getting to, close to the wear. Again, the devil is in the details, and it's really quite, quite remarkable. So here are these British strategic planners, some of them in London, some of them in Cairo, and when it came to the Iraqi mandate, some of them in Delhi, all right? This was, this was a bureaucratic for, formula just waiting to cause trouble. Whenever you have your foreign policy organized and, and run from three different places, you're going to have some trouble, okay? Uh, the British were, were in, intent on taking the mandate from Mesopotamia, and that had to do with, with oil, and that had to do with strategic um, uh, entree to, uh, to Persia. That had to do with a, a lot of, a lot of uh, and again, securing the route to India right across, right across the, the water from, from India. But then they realized that they needed connectivity of some sort. They wanted overland connectivity between the Iraq mandate on the one hand and the Levant, the Eastern Mediterranean, on the other. Now, in between, if you just look at any map, I mean, I don't have a, 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 the kind of map that would show topography, but if you look at, at these maps, you see I've, I've called the first one Palestine Mandate 1920, question mark, <laughs> all right? Uh, you see that between I Iraq uh, and, uh, and Palestine, there's this, there's this rather substantial expanse of land. It's mostly desert. It's, 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 tough, it's tough going in this, in this area. What were the British going to do with all that land? They wanted, to, they wanted to have some kind of control over it or some kind of influence or some kind of concession within it. Most of this land, if you join Zone A and Zone B, where the independent Arab, sp Arab state was supposed to come into existence, according to Sykes-Picot, uh, what were the British going to do with this stuff, uh, with, all this, with all, this sand, all this sand rocks and scorpions? What were they going to do with it? And this was known, and it's in, if you read the archives, you, you know this, this was known as the Arabian chapter problem. And a great deal of British diplomacy and legal exertions between the time that General Allenby's armies occupied Jerusalem in, 19, in 1918, December, November, December 1918, and the rolling out of the whole mandatory scheme, uh, a great deal of, of energy and effort is put in, 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 in the British government into figuring out how to solve the Arabian chapter problem, okay? Um, boy, there's just too much to say and not enough time to say it. Uh, in any event, uh, what they, they, there's a railhead back in these days already in Haifa. And railroads were the sinews of empire. It was the way you got back and forth. So the British were determined to uh, keep uh, territorial contiguity between a, a way to get back and forth between their, their, uh, their, their uh, Mesopotamia mandate and their new position on the Eastern Med, Eastern Mediterranean. And so uh, the idea that the mandate should be turned over to uh, the Americans went out the door. And the idea that the French proposed, not surprisingly, that a great deal of this territory in southern Syria be uh, subject to French influence also went out the door. Now, you'll notice two other facts that uh, are important here. Uh, if the Allies made a deal called Sykes-Picot, right, you would expect that they would then consummate the deal. And there is an, a map attended Sykes-Picot, as I told you. Also, I didn't mention that, but I should. A map attended the Hussein McMahon correspondence as well. There was a map. And the descriptions and the correspondence of what would be part of the independent Arab state and what would not, and what, what would not be part of the independent Arab state uh, uh, unleashed a, a debate and a controversy in Britain and beyond Britain for 30 years as to whether Sir Henry McMahon promised that Palestine would be part of the independent Arab state or not. And what you find in, in these in this decades of argumentation over what, what the correspondence says and what was meant and what was understood and not, McMahon himself, in 19, I think it was 1934, 37, I can't remember. I'm past 60, I can't remember dates or names anymore. Uh, uh, McMahon said that it, it, Palestine was not included in the promise and that Sharif Hussein understood completely that that was the case. Ali Kadori in a book called The, uh, Anglo, the Anglo Arab Labyrinth, written back in the ancient days, uh, 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 makes the same argument. But other, others, depending on the circumstances, uh, Ormsby Gore, Lord Halifax, others over the years claim precisely the reverse. They take apart the language of the correspondence, they, they, uh, they compare it with the map, and they say that this is nonsense, and that it was, it was inevitable that Sharif Hussein and everybody associated on the Arab side would understand that Palestine was part of the promise and not excluded from it. So this will never be settled. <laughs> if the British themselves could have settled it in 35 or 40 years, we won't settle it either. But anyway, uh, but Sykes-Picot was dead. Whatever uh, Sir Henry McMahon had said, or whatever Sykes-Picot had indicated 
Sykes-Picot was dead by, by 1918, 1919, and it was dead for two reasons. Uh, one, uh, the British military essentially ruled the roost. Allenby's armies were there. Uh, there was essentially no French force to speak of uh, in the Arab, the Arab domains of the Ottoman Empire. So, you know, uh, you know uh, as I think, uh, who, who was it said that, that being there is three quarters of the, of the battle, or maybe it was Woody Allen, I don't know. Yeah, but, but in any event, in any event, you know, the British were there, and, uh, you know, force, force casts a shadow, and that shadow's called influence. And if you're there and you, you've got the goods, uh, just, just dare somebody to take them away from you. And the British Army, coming up from Egypt, pretty formidable force. Um, they had Arab allies, don't forget. Uh, the French were really stuck, so that was one thing. Second thing was, if you look at the map of Sykes-Picot, you see that the French defined Syria as jutting way, way up into what was Turkey, essentially. Not just Arab lands, but, but lands that are, were part of Anatolia. And of course, the Turks were not defeated, in the sense that the, the, uh, the uh, Allied armies never occupied Turkish territory uh, in, in, uh, in, in any substance. I mean, they only occupied uh, parts of the Arab, the Arab domain. So uh, Sykes-Picot was a dead letter, and everything kind of fell back to um, the, the sketchboard. How were we going to create these mandates? How are we going to divide them up? How are we going to assign them? So by 1919, it's pretty clear that the French are going to have the mandate, mandate for Syria, which includes Lebanon. The British are going to have the mandate for Mesopotamia. And they're going to have the mandate for Palestine. The question now is the where. Where the hell were these places? What were the borders going to be? OK, you have this map. Let me just check at my watch here. I'm, I'm worried about the time. A couple minutes. A couple minutes? Yay! <laughs> okay, well, I'm just going to have to cut it short, I guess. So painful. Um, <clears throat> this map, uh, many of you have seen this map, one way or another, or you will if you continue to ferry around in this, uh, in this subject. Uh, I don't know why I'm holding it up, because you got it. Uh, Palestine mandate. <laughs> this mandate for Palestine, April 24th, 1920. April 24th, 1920 is the date of San Remo. All right? Now, look at this map. This map uh, is an example of what I call bullshistery. That's a neologism that I invented some years ago. This is a creative reading of history for uh, various and uh, various sundry and self-interested self purposes. This is the kind of map that revisionist Zionism, right-wing Zionism, for years, until the Likud party and Benjamin Netanyahu sort of threw in with the two-state solution uh, just west of the river. Uh, this was the kind of map you saw all the time. And the argument was that originally, that, a map, that, that essentially a map came with the, with the Balfour Declaration in November 1917. And of course, there was no such map. I defy, I defy anybody to find a map associated with the Balfour Declaration. The Anglicans uh, in those days were very Judeophilic. Uh, they were dispensationalist Christians. A lot of them were influenced by John Nelson Darby, but never mind the history of the Anglican Church and the, uh, the Christian Zionism. You know, there was Christian Zionism before there was Jewish Zionism. You realize that, that, that Naftali Hertz, the guy who wrote the lyrics to, to Hatikva, only became a Zionist because he was traveling with a Christian guy to the Middle East, and he was his amanuensis, you know, his, and he schlepped his, uh, his bags. He only became a Zionist after, after, uh, after his, uh, his name was Oliphant. He was traveling with a guy named Oliphant. Not the cartoonist, another Oliphant. Uh, so there was Christian Zionism in Britain before there was, before Herzl, before there was, before, and you know, you, you, George Eliot writing Daniel Deronda. This was, a, this was part of the, the, the cultural uh, uh, ambit of Victorian England. Very, very, uh, very Jew-centric and very Judeophilic for the most part. Uh, but there's a twist there. I won't go into it. Um, so, uh, uh, they understood the Palestine to mean from Dan to Beersheba. Every single Anglican Bible, all the Bibles that were printed, had a little color-plated map in the front or somewhere in the Bible. And it was all divided up according to the 12 tri called the tribes. So there was Don and, and, and uh, Zebulun and, 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 and Judah and Sh Sh Shimon and Menasha. They were all colored in. So in their mind's eye, they knew what Palestine was because they'd seen it in their Bibles going back for a century, you know? And that's what Palestine was. Now, that Palestine, of course, from Don to Beersheba, well, people knew where Beersheba was. That was still on the map. Where the hell was Don? Right? You looked at a contemporary map of the Middle East, looked for a place called Don. Not there. Okay? Um, so where was it? Again, if you look at the map uh, of uh, Palestine on the Sykes-Picot map, it doesn't look anything at all like what the mandate became. Right? So, uh, so what happened? So what happened in a nutshell is that 
at San Remo, Britain was, was assigned, and of course it assigned itself naturally, but it was assigned formally the League of Nations mandate for Palestine. It wasn't a, a type A mandate. Because, why? Now, as I promised I would tell you now, I will. The, uh, the principle of self-determination, majority rule, is embedded in the concept of the mandate. Because the idea was that the, uh, the, the uh, mandatory power was going to make ready this, these people for, for sovereignty and independence. And of course, according to the principle of self-determination, that was part and parcel of the war to end all wars, and which was the justification for the dismemberment of the, of the Habsburg and the Ottoman empires, right? That uh, the principle of national self, principle of national, national self-determination in those days was a very progressive idea, because it was anti-imperial. Nowadays, nationalism doesn't have quite the same patina <laughs> as it did then, but then it was a progressive idea in the minds of, of the great statesmen, European statesmen. So, uh, they knew, they knew nothing actually about where, Don, they didn't know anything about the geography of the country, hardly anything. Uh, the, first, uh, the first person to really, uh, the first geologist who came to Palestine to try to figure out where things were and try to concord contemporary place names with those in the Bible was a guy named Lynch, a captain from the U.S. Navy who went there in the 1830s, but that's another story. We won't tell that story. So um, this, this map purports to be the map of San Ramo. But if you actually look at the documents, this is complete bullshittery. Let's just look at this for a minute here. This, this, uh, the, look at the border of the border between between what became Transjordan or Jordan, all right, and what is it says Arabia, Saudi Arabia today, right? When was that? When was that? When was that? When was this part of the down this part down here? When was that part of the of the border drawn, all right? Uh, that that of course it's, it's it still isn't very well demarcated today. But it wasn't, it wasn't drawn until, until uh, 1930, 1932. And that's because in, 19, in, in 1920, 22, 23, the Hejaz was still Hashemite. The Saudis, the, uh, the, the Saudis didn't kick the Hashemites out of, out of Mecca until 1924, 25. And it was only after that, 1932, that Saudi Arabia became a unitary state. Before that, it was called the Kingdom of Nej and the Hejaz. It became a unitary state called Saudi Arabia only in 1932. And it was only after that that the state had the capacity to negotiate with its neighbors as to where the border should be. So that border didn't exist in 1917 or 1920. It didn't exist until 1932. What about, what, look at this weird thing here, okay? This is referred to as, as Churchill's hiccup. I, I would uh, go into detail about how Jordan got to be this shape, but I won't do it because I don't have time. But, but this border here between Syria and Jordan, okay, uh, Part of it was drawn in 1920, 23. I'll go into that in just a second. But most of it wasn't actually finished until 1931. That was when the agreement took place. So, uh, and, the, and the border between the Iraq mandate uh, and, and, and Transjordan, this border here with the little squiggles and so on, uh, that actually wasn't finished and border cans, cairns weren't put up until or also the early 1930s. So the idea that everybody knew that this was the Palestine mandate in 1920 at San Remo is bullshittery. What actually happened was as follows. Uh, from a legal point of view, in order to ratify the mandates and deposit them with the League of Nations, Article 22 says you have to have borders. Since there were no borders, since there was no agreement on where Syria uh, started and ended and where Palestine started and ended, basically what happened was, in a nutshell, and I'll wrap up here, uh, the British solved the Arabian chapter problem by creating the Emirate of Transjordan. They did this in, uh, after uh, famously caught over cigars and brandy. Winston Churchill did this after he became colonial secretary in, uh, in Jerusalem in 1921. Transjordan was only added to the Palestine mandate before it was deposited in the League, was only added to it in order to separate it. The Churchill White Paper in uh, September 1922 separated Transjordan away, and the, the stipulations that had to do with the Jewish national home were uh, severed from uh, having anything to do with the territory of what became the Emirate of Trans Transjordan, all right? So the idea that this area was always going to be part of the mandate is simply wrong for legal reasons because the British had no basis under the man uh, they had no legal basis to, to rule or to be present or to have influence in, in what became Jordan, Transjordan. They added it to the mandate for legal reasons for the sole purpose of separating it. Now, the, uh, the borders were fine, there was a, a border commission that was appointed, an Anglo-French border commission called the Nukem Paulet, or Paulet Nukem, depending on if you're French or British, which name goes first, border commission. And the history of this border commission is absolutely fascinating. When I, when I uh, was at the Dion Center, I wrote a book on it, okay? And here's the book. And I would love to tell you how to get the book, but you can't because it's very hard to get. I'm, 
In any event, that's not important. <laughs> the, I've only got a couple copies left myself. That's not important. The important thing is, the the uh, the uh, um, uh, the mandate was was deposited the, was deposited with the League of Nations in July of 1923, and the separation no 1922 and the separation. Uh, of, of Transjordan having just been added, the separation took place in September. So for, for at most, at most, from July to September, Jordan was part of the Palestine mandate. But in fact, it was, uh, it was in motion, it was a moving target, and Transjordan or Jordan was never really part of the Palestine mandate. So the revisionist argument that Jordan is Palestine, right? The, in other words, the, the Palestinians can have the East Bank, they can have where King Hussein and now King Abdallah are, right? So this still ramifies in, into the present. Uh, that argument is just absolute historical fraud, just plain historical fraud. It's a self-interested example of, as I say, bullshittery. Now, that doesn't mean that people don't believe it. A lot of people believe it. I asked you to read David Fromkin's book, A Peace to End All Peace. He didn't go to the archives. It's a great book. It's a great read. But it repeats this error and many other errors that have, uh, that have risen up in the secondary literature. It opened my eyes when I actually read the archives and went, oh, my God, all this stuff that I was taught, uh, all these years, it's wrong. <laughs> I have no hope of actually correcting the historical record, you know, the common conception, because it's like a nail without a head, like I said. Once it gets in there, you can't get it out. You have to burn the whole building down to find the nail. So we don't want to do that. We have enough problems the way they are. So now, just look at the second map really quickly, Versailles. This is the Zionist proposal to the, tr to the conference at Versailles. The red line on the outside of it, right? This is a result of the, 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 the weitzmann Faisal uh, understanding and correspondence. How in the world could Palestine have gone all the way out to the far eastern borders of Jordan? If that were the case, why would the Zionists ask for so much less? You see? I mean, the simple logic here is kind of overwhelming. And I was going to talk more about the Nukem Paulet uh, Commission, but I just want to point out one thing. If you look at uh, the mandatory the map that says 1920 23, the tentative 1920 line, okay, which was just meant to be a, t it was, the, the, the 1920 line was a result of the uh, uh, Occupied Enemy Territories Administration. When the uh, uh, British Army, when the dust settled, uh, General Allenby uh, imposed military rule on the areas where the, his, his, his forces were, and they divided them into three OETAs, all right? OETA North uh, had, this, had this line, so in 1920, there was this tentative idea that the border should go. Now look where the line goes, down here. It goes right, it, it includes a lot of the Golan Heights, not, not all of it, but a lot of the Golan Heights that, were not, that was not part of Israel after, after 1948, but it goes right smack through the center of the Sea of Galilee. Right smack through the center of the Sea of Galilee. And it excludes, you see where it says Semach down by the, there's a train station there, where the, where the Yarmouk River comes in to the Jordan. That little triangle is incredibly sensitive for hydrological reasons for what reasons having to do with water. And in, in very important in this whole story is a guy named Pinchas Rutenberg, a remarkable fellow. Uh, the, the Israelis built a power station at Naharayim, the two rivers, where those rivers come together. Incredibly sensitive uh, uh, geography, hyd hydrological geography. The, the border, as it turned out after 1923, and I, I, t I talk about the, sw the land swaps and how, and how eventually the borders of Palestine came to include all of Tiberias, all of the Sea of Galilee, all right? Uh, uh, it would have basically given the successor to the Syrian mandate, that is the, 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 the government of Syria, it would have given them riparian rights on the Sea of Galilee. The negotiations between Israel and Syria that Itamar Rabinovich was involved with some years ago, one of the reasons they failed, maybe the main reason that they failed, was that the Syrians insisted on going back to the demilitarized, the, 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 the de facto border of the, of the demilitarized zones, uh, after, 19, after 1948, which would have given Syria riparian rights on the Sea of Galilee, and which would have compromised Israel's ability to use the water in its national water carrier. And, for the, and this is a small amount of land. This is a couple of, a couple of meters of land. But the, but the legal principle is critical. And that's, that's basically, that goes back to this border commission and how these borders were drawn back in between 1920 and 1923. There was a British diplomat named Robert Vansittart uh, who was in charge of all this from the British side. I kind of fell in love with the guy. I mean, it was, you really become friends with the characters when you, when you get involved in the history. And so I'm going to stop there and just go to, just to well, basically the idea is that's why the mandates happen. That's kind of how they happen. And, uh, and surprisingly, where they happen is not nearly as simple as a lot of people think. Now, what I've got here, to, to, to show, and tell, show and tell time now, 
I do have a copy of the magazine, as Walter predicted, or Alan predicted. Pass it around. Uh, wherever, it, wherever it stops, nobody knows. And what I've got, I brought you, just for fun, uh, I brought you some postage stamps. I'm going to pass these around to one. I better get them back, folks. <laughs> these are stamps uh, of the Palestine Mandate starting in 1918, 19, the very beginning. Okay, The ones on top, uh, say at the, they don't say Palestine. They say at the top, E-E-F. E-E-F. What's that mean? Anybody know? You be quiet because you know. I know you know. Egyptian Expeditionary Force. Uh, this, these are the, this, is, this were printed in Cairo, and this, this is the stamps that were used in Palestine, brought along with Allenby's army. Down here, later on, you'll see uh, symbols of Palestine and so forth uh, on the, man, the mandate stamps uh, that started to be printed in 1928, something like that, and lasted until the end of the mandate in 1947, about which Dr. Washington, Washington will talk to you in a few minutes. And uh, so I'll pass these around, and then pass these around. And this, uh, this is a set of stamps of Transjordan in 1946 when the Emirate became independent. And, and there's one stamp up here that shows the unification of the banks when Jordan annexed the West Bank after the 1948 war. It didn't annex it until April 1950, but this is a stamp commemorating the, uh, the joining of the West Bank, which the Jordanians, which the Hashemites, never called Palestine. They called it the West Bank uh, to the rest of the country. It's a kind of an interesting historical stamp. So I'll pass these around. I'm sorry I spoke too long. I had Mission Impossible, and I'm not Peter Graves, and I couldn't, I couldn't do it. Um, but I'm done, and if there's any time for questions, then we'll, we'll do that. Uh, and like, I, sk I skipped a lot, I simplified a lot, I apologize, um, but, you know, I told you. Um, I didn't break out into a chant, okay? <laughs> that didn't happen, okay. Thank you, Adam. Well, that was a mouthful. <laughs> I hate to hear the complicated story. Ah, <laughs> you want to? <laughs> anyway, we do have time for questions. We have uh, two people, Megan and, and Rachel, who have microphones. Please wait for the microphone to come to you. Uh, we are videotaping this for posting on our website, so we want to get the questions in as well as the answers. So we have someone in the back. Maybe state your name and your school. Yes, my name is Richard White. And I just want to ask a question about the, about the involvement of some of the Americans like Crane. He was a consultant to oil companies, as were a bunch of missionaries who came back and they went to Princeton. Was this in the same period, the 1920s, or was that a, a bit later? Because if it was the same period, then there's another motive for the, for the U.S. not to want mandates. Well, what would be the motive? It was the same period, yeah. What, what, okay. you, what, what, are you, what are you suggesting as the motive? Well, I mean, no, let me, let me back up. I think it'd be a motive for the U.S. not to support imperial uh, designs of Europe because then that, that would make the, the areas in the Middle East more independent and that would make it more open to, 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 the, uh, uh, to the U.S. oil interests. Uh-huh, that, that's true. I, had, um, I, don't, you know, I don't think that uh, King and Crane... Um, were cynics like that. I don't think that's really what their, what their motivation was. I think they kind of, I mean, the, but people complained about them, you know, to President Wilson. Uh, Colonel House complained about them. Secretary Lansing complained about them. And the complaint was, why are you sending these two guys out there? They don't know a damn thing about the region. And Wilson said, that is their merit, okay? They don't know a damn thing about the region, therefore they're not biased. They'll just, they'll just see, tell it, it's, it's a very Jeffersonian uh, impulse, you know. Uh, Jefferson, Jefferson said, if you ask a philosopher, if you had a choice of asking a question of a philosopher or a farmer, who would you ask? And Jefferson said, ask the farmer, because it doesn't have any preconceived, you know, weird notions, basically. I'm paraphrasing Jefferson. Same thing. I mean, we're like that. I mean, we, we really believe that, you know, um, you send basic guys out there, intelligent people, re reasonable people, they will, they will see a situation in an unbiased way and report back. That's pretty much, I think, what King and Crane tried to do. I, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't, um, Maybe I'm, maybe I'm naive, but I, I wouldn't ascribe any peripheral motives to, to the report, really. Um, they, were, they, were, you know, they were men of their time. They believed in the sort of simple proposition of self-determination and majority rule, and then that's, how they, that's how they operated. That's what they saw. Uh, Captain Tom Daniel, I am the a teacher at uh, W.P. Davison High School in Mobile, Alabama. I'm also a retired Navy captain, so I was intrigued, uh, your mention of a, of a Navy captain who was involved, and I'd just like uh, if you could say a little bit more about that or, or at least point me in a direction where I could do some more research and 
and uh -huh. determine some more information about that, about that well, individual. There, there are lots of books. There are several books. They're really good books that uh, talk about the history of the United States and the Middle East. And Captain Lynch, um, talk about a colorful story. Uh, the best way to do it is just, I think his first name was Thomas. Am I, is that right, uh, Shy? Am I forgetting the right name? Do you know about this? I think his name was Thomas Lynch. Uh, I think he went in 1837. So if you just, if you just type into Google, Captain Lynch, uh, Palestine, 1837, uh, a Wikipedia article will come up, which is, of course, not to be taken at face value, right? But um, if you're educated, you can make some use of it. And there'll probably be a, a, a bibliography. Or the other way to do it is to give me your card, uh, and I will be able to um, uh, send you my references. So you can look up uh, what Captain Lynch basically took a raft and went up and down the Jordan River. And the Jordan River, back in those days, it was pretty wild. I mean, not a lot of people lived in the Jordan Valley because it was a malarial swamp. Uh, and there were wild animals. I mean, my God, there were, there were, you know, there were lions uh, and other nasty animals hanging around. Uh, there weren't a lot of people living there. Almost all the people who lived in the Jordan Valley were very dark-skinned because they were runaway slaves from previous times. Very interesting story. And Lynch uh, was one of the first you know, Westerner to, to survey the Hula Valley and the Hula Swamp. And he made his way all the way up, uh, ultimately, I think, all the way up to Banyas. Now, Banyas, if you look at a map, Banyas is in the Golan Heights, but uh, Banyas uh, uh, is one of the three headwaters of the Jordan River, along with Don and the Hasbani. Uh, that creates, that, 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 um, creates the Jordan River, those three streams. And then the Jordan, of course, flows down, is met by the Yarmouk coming from the east, and ends up uh, emptying into the Dead Sea. And Lynch basically was interested in the hydrology of the area. He was interested in the water. Um, I don't know why, but that's what he did. So he had, he had great adventures. I mean, we all know about Theodore Roosevelt going down the Orinoco, the River of Death. I don't think Lynch's trip was quite as exciting as that, and he never became president, but it's damned exciting. <laughs> so plenty to read about Captain Lynch. Thank you. Hi. Uh, Patrick Tuart. Uh, I have a question. Um, I'm from Virginia, and uh, you, you mentioned something in sort of peripheral about uh, Bismarck and International Labor Union, but I, I have a question about Bismarck, and I, I don't know, it's sort of counterfactual, but was he, would he have been, or was he supportive of this relationship with the Ottoman Empire because of all the people, it seems, in Central Europe and European history prior to the Great War, mm -hmm. the one who most seemed to see it coming, at least from my studies of Bismarck, mm -hmm. uh, was he? So would he? Would he? I know he was out in 1890, uh, the, the the Berlin to Baghdad railways, Kaiser Wilhelm II's baby. Yeah. So would he potentially? Do you think, or is it something that's beyond your knowledge? Have been in favor or opposed? Yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I what I know about Bismarck is um, limited. I don't. I, I can't. I can't project myself backwards and get into his head as regards the Ottoman Empire, but he was a savvy and successful statesman. And given the lay of interests at the time, it seems to me likely that he would have understood uh, the value of a close relationship between uh, unified Germany and the Ottoman Empire. The, the, the supply relationships and the training relationships actually go back to that time. Um, they, they really get going, you know, in the 1880s. And he's still around then. So I, I'm, I, yeah, I think probably he had a pretty good grasp of the strategic implications of that, of that partnership. And the Berlin to Baghdad Railroad, I think that, that scheme was hatched when he was still very much around. Um, it, it's always interesting to speculate on what would have happened if, if the people after Bismarck had had 1 20th of his acumen and his understanding. But the, ones, the, people, the people who came after Bismarck, not, not to exclude the Kaiser himself, were a bunch of boobs. They really screwed it up, you know. Um, which, by the way, to get back to the, to, the, uh, to the conclusion that I gave you at the beginning, all right? It's complicated. I mean, it really is complicated. Uh, and I'd like to quote in this regard uh, a famous American philosopher, uh, Chuck Berry, <laughs> who said, and I quote, C'est la vie, say the old folks. It goes to show you never can tell. Close quote. Yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Greg Smith. I teach at Messina Regional High School in New Hampshire. And uh, you mentioned uh, that uh, Churchill and the British Commission planned on separating Transjordan uh, from that mandate pretty much immediately. Uh, but you also said that uh, mandates per uh, 
the plan were to have a people to hand it off to. So I'm curious, do you know, was the plan to hand Transjordan to the Hashemites immediately, or did they have other peoples in mind? Oh, okay, well, that's just one of the elements of the story that is well known and fascinating that I didn't have time to go into. I, if I'd gone into any more tangents, you know, it would have been even worse than it was, to be perfectly honest. Uh, the deal was this, you know, Faisal ends up in, in Damascus in 1919, 1920. The French kick him out in, in June of 1920. This creates a real crisis. I mean, the British and the French were allies during the war, but they were very suspicious of one another. Still, they had been comp colonial competitors for many, many, many years. And since the British had the upper hand mil militarily, the French believed, and the French government, by the way, was very um, uh, unstable. I mean, the, the, the government seemed to change every couple of weeks or every couple of months after World War I. So you have one foreign minister, and then you have Poincaré, another foreign minister. It really, and it re it's really pretty convoluted. Uh, uh, domestic politics plays an important role uh, on the French side, a little less on the British side, but on the British side, too, because when Churchill becomes colonial secretary, everything changes. Because Churchill had a very impo important relationship with Pinchas Rutenberg. And it was Churchill who wanted more expansive borders for Palestine in the north and northeast for hydrological reasons. Churchill understood all this. Okay. Uh, uh, I lost my train of thought. What was <laughs> Transjordan. Oh, yeah. Uh, so basically what they did was um, uh, they had a problem. They were trying to find a way to rule indirectly so as to save a lot of money. So when Faisal was, was booted out of Damascus by the French, I forget the name of the battle, it was near Derat. It was right near the border between uh, what is today Jordan and what is today Syria. So uh, his brother, Abdallah, the young, his brother, uh, is down at Aqaba, okay, after the Arab revolt. And he hears about the French, you know, hammering on his brother. And so he tries to rush to his brother's defense. And so he tears up the eastern side of the Jordan River, and they're hauling with them this ancient Turkish cannon that they had captured, okay. Uh, they arrive at the scene of the battle. They turn the cannon on the French troops. They light the cannon, and it explodes in their faces. It was not a, it was a rather ignominious, but there is Abdallah. Abdallah, is, is the brother, is suddenly there, right smack in the middle of, of the action, and here it is, it's, 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 it's the summer of 1920. What do the British do? Along comes Churchill and he says, and actually the man who actually thought of this was a remarkable individual named Percy Zachariah Cox. If you really want to have fun with biography, uh, just, go, just go fiddle around with the name Percy Zachariah Cox, and you'll run into Gertrude Bell very quickly. But you will, you will see the British, British personages that created the, the monstrosity of the state of Iraq, which used to exist and today no longer does. Really doesn't exist anymore, in any event. Uh, Percy Cox is the one who drew the boundaries of the Mesopotamian Iraqi mandate. Uh, uh, so what happened, in a nutshell, was that the, the, Cox decides, or Cox suggests, and Churchill agrees, that Faisal should be made uh, the king of Iraq. Of, so he's, He's kicked out of Damascus only to be taken to Baghdad. Formerly, his brother Zaid uh, was going to be the emir there. Don't forget, the Hussein man, man correspondence was very useful to Sharif Hussein in Mecca because it basically meant that he was going to decide who would reign over this Arab sovereignty after the war ended. So this was really good for the Hashemites. And it was really not so good for all the other Arabs who weren't fond of the Hashemites. But that isn't the, that isn't the issue. Uh, meanwhile, um, so there's Abdallah sitting in the middle of the desert with a bunch of camels and a cannon that doesn't work. And so Churchill decides, ah, we'll put Abdallah in Amman, in Transjordan. So they basically Hashemited the area. They Hashemited the British possessions. They put one Hashemite in Baghdad. They put another Hashemite in Amman. And uh, that's how it started. So Abdallah was the first, was the emir after 1946 when the country became uh, an independent, so-called Transjordan, he became king. And that's the line. The Hashemite line remains in Jordan. It went from Abdallah to Talal to Hussein, and now to Abdallah again, you know, the younger Abdallah. Uh, it ended in Iraq on uh, July 28, 1958, when a military coup overthrew the Hashemite monarchy, killed the king and Nuri al Said, and that was a mess. Um, is that okay? Is that good enough? Yeah. So the Hashemites were there from the get go. Adam? Shai Feldman. Yeah, I know. Um, Adam, can you talk a little bit about um, this this map, the 16 to uh, to 19? Um, Which one? The uh, the 16 to the to 19 map. Yeah, yeah. Which is probably the most confusing map. 
it's a pretty confusing map. Right. But uh, let me let me just make my question very specific. Yeah. Um, first of all, so um, the so first of all, um, what I understood uh, from my much more superficial reading of this history than yours, that actually uh, the Newcomb Paulet was essentially, they were assigned essentially to operationalize Sykes-Picot. I mean, that's no. at least, at least, so uh, that's where, okay. But I, my, <laughs> my real question is this. Um, it's very easy to, to see two things. Number one, that there are big gaps between the two. In other words, they're, they're very much not the same line. Right. And so, so can you just say a few words about two things? Number one, what happens between uh, 1916 and 1923 that motivates uh, this? Because essentially these two fellows are assigned by the British and the French to, to, to redraw or to, to draw. And my history was that it was to draw, but, but I, I, I understand it, it's to not. Redraw. The, yeah. way, the way that, actually just as a footnote, the way this is portrayed in Uwe Sagi's book where, he's told, where, where he does the homework to prepare for this boundaries issue for the negotiations with the Syrians, he presents, but again, it's just a narrative, the new Pole is an opera operationalization of Sykes-Picot, but yeah. I understand that this is more complicated it's because more otherwise, complicated. otherwise there wouldn't be that much of a deviation. That's so right, so you first, are right. So first of all, what, what explains the logic that, uh, that apparently uh, Poulet and Newcomb had a different logic to explain the different map than Sykes-Picot, that's number one. Number two, is that a mistake on the upper side of the, the whatever you call it, the table or the, because it says, uh, it says final little boundary, uh, and it says in parentheses operative border until June '67. Mm -hmm. But that's that, yeah. But well, it's the operative border excluding the demilitarized zones. All right, it was the operative oh. border excluding okay. the demilitarized zones. Right, yeah. but that's a big exclusion because that's it's what the whole conflict in the 1950s was about. Of course, that's yeah. the, the Battle of Al Himma. You know, I mean, you know this better than me. I mean, uh, okay, uh, the, the it's not true. Uh, in any direct sense, that the Newcomb Pauli Commission was the operationalization of Sykes Picot, because as, as I explained, Sykes Picot became a dead letter. It became a dead letter essentially for three reasons. One, the Russians leaked it, and Sir Henry McMahon had to resign. Second, the, the, the activity of the British military changed uh, the balance of power on the ground as to, as to where b lines would be. And, and third, uh, the, the, since the Turks were not defeated, and the French zone to the north of the, of the French, the blue zone, uh, could not be consummated because they didn't occupy Turkish territory, the French, the, it, Sykes Picot became a dead letter. Now, as I said, uh, the, the lines that, the, the first lines that were drawn, they were not drawn around the old vilayets, the old Sanjaks of the Ottoman Empire. They were drawn by Allenby and his staff as military occupation zones. That's why I've got the OETA, um, Occupation of Enemy, ter uh, Enemy Territory Administration on here. That was kind of a fait accompli, a kind of thing that just kind of came out of the blue for reasons of military necessity and administration. And the military government lasted for about two years. You know, they had, they had to figure out some way of, of you know, organizing life. So there was a military administration in, in most of this area for something like 18 months to two years. So that's what the OETAs were. It was a kind of a, a government on training wheels, in a way, you know, for the mandate, for the British mandate. So what Newcomb and Paulet were, uh, were asked to do, uh, there was a, I forgot to, to mention, I didn't have time, there was an Anglo-French convention in 1920. Which, which, after Sam Raimo, which talked about getting together to work out these lines. Now, once the French were, once the French, things changed a lot in June. Before Faisal was evicted from Damascus, the French thought of Faisal as a British agent trying to deprive them of their rights in Syria. And they had traded Mosul to the British over in Mesopotamia in order to get an expansive definition of their rights in Syria. So the French thought that the British were screwing them, but good, that Faisal was an agent. Once they got rid of Faisal, they relaxed a little bit. There was also a new government. Poincaré became foreign minister. They relaxed a little bit, and they weren't as overwhelmingly concerned about uh, the border between uh, Mesopotamia, I mean, between uh, the Syrian mandate and Palestine mandate. Churchill was concerned, and he was influenced dramatically by Pinchas Rutenberg. There's a book in Hebrew called Ish Chazak Be'eret Yisrael. You can get it in the library. You should read it. I mean, it's a, it's a great book. I forget the author's name. It's called Ish Chazak Be'eret Yisrael. In any event, uh, it was mainly for hydrological reasons. Uh, what, what Churchill wanted and what Rutenberg wanted was for the northern border to reach all the way to the Mitanni, 
for reasons of hydroelectric power and so forth. And there's still people who argue that in the context of an Israeli-Lebanese treaty, there should be some, some arrangement made over sharing the waters of, of the Litani, because the Lebanese don't really need them. They have plenty of other rivers. But it would be really helpful if, if Israel could use the waters of, of the Litani. But uh, that didn't happen. Uh, the French you know, uh, wouldn't let the border go that far north. There were, there were um, uh, lots of uh, amendments uh, at the very end of the Nukampale period along the Israeli-Lebanese border. It involves the seven, the seven villages, Sasa and the other six, and that's still a matter of, of uh, if, there, if we ever get to a Lebanese-Israeli negotiation, those seven villages, Sasa et al., that's going to become an issue, a big issue, about where the border is. So just like, just like Shaba, Shaba Farms, whether it's really Syria, whether it's really Lebanon, who knows? Probably it's Syria. Anyway, uh, but they never demarcated the border for Shaba Farms, as you, as you know. So um, th this this this. Uh, border Commission labored for years, a couple of years, and the Zionists lobbied, and, uh, and Churchill had, had a personal interest in it, uh, and it had a lot to do with water, and basically the British delayed, the British delayed, the British delayed, then the French delayed because their politics got all screwed up, and it took a long time. Uh, the stuff was actually finished uh, in 1922, but Newcomb had to sign the document. He was in Australia. So the, other, the, the delay uh, had to do with getting him back from Australia so he could actually sign the document. They didn't have you know, the internet in those days where you could sign electronically. So it's a, it's a fascinating story, but, but it, it really has to do with the Zionists and the British slowly but surely delaying, prevaricating, proposing, pushing the border out. There's a fascinating little curlicue here that I think you'll, you'll find interesting. In the documents uh, of the, of the, of the Newcomb Pauli Commission negotiations, there's a fascinating little uh, thing about Banyas. Uh, the British wanted, uh, and the Zionists wanted Banyas, because they wanted all three of the headwaters of the Jordan inside Palestine. So they wanted Banyas, and as you know, Banyas ended up on the wrong side, it ended up on the Syrian side after the, after the finalization of the boundaries. So there's a, there's a codicil in the, uh, in, the, uh, in, in, the, in the deal, which says as follows. There's a road uh, to Banyas from Majd al-Shams, I think, and I'm not sure exactly, there's another road. So the idea was, was put, it's in the documents, for if the, if, if, the, if, the, if the British in Palestine build a southern road of access from uh, near Semach up, uh, up along the, 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 the valley over to, um, over to Banyas, then Banyas will, will uh, go back into Palestine. And even the price of the road is mentioned, 5,000 pounds. So if the British uh, had built the road, the French would have been obligated to, to amend the border and Banyas would have been part of Palestine. They never built the road. Can you believe it? They never built the stupid road. So the IDF had to take it in 1967. There you go. For lack, you know, for lack of, for lack of 5,000 pounds. Thank you, Adam Garfinkel. You're welcome.